And I want to thank everyone and welcome everyone again, uh, for especially those who are joining us uh, via live stream as well. Uh, it's my understanding that we have folks, attendees from Nigeria, who are eager to hear the inspiring words of Abiola. The CW's 2022 Cristobal Kotelawala Leseringe Lecture. I hope I didn't do too badly. <laughs> Thank you. You're very forgiving. <laughs> this lecture has been two years in the making, having been postponed in 2020 due to COVID. This lecture is particularly significant as it means that we have to let go of what was and are defining a new reality, which includes being in community, in person and virtually, which is something that we wouldn't have been even considered or thought was possible before COVID. For those of us in the room, we have engaged under different principles than we did three years ago. People are more aware of their boundaries, under in, whether how close we are to each other or how we greet each other, making personal decisions about wearing masks or not wearing a mask, how food is served, consumed, we've had to change a lot about how we do our daily lives in the last what, two and a half, almost three years, hard to believe. And all of this happening with less judgment about how each person's individual decisions, uh, how they make them and what, what this means for them for this pandemic. As some of you know, for the past over two years, Tiffany has been in communication with Aviola. And finally, in this past week or so, we've had a chance to meet her as she's come to Ann Arbor. In this short amount of time, she has conveyed her experiences to provide legal representation to survivors of domestic violence and sexual assault, represented women in their fight for equal rights, challenged officials to hold true to their campaign promises, and aligned activists across Nigeria to work towards a shared set of imperatives to achieve gender e equity. We have learned much about her partnership values and strategies, which has made us reflect on our own model of partnerships. We invite you to read more about Abiola on page 11 of the program. And if we went through all of her accomplishments, we would be here a lot longer than what this program has allowed us to be here for. <laughs> we are very, very grateful to Menaka Bailey for entrusting CNW Plus with the task of identifying individuals who carry forward her mother's legacy through the CW Plus Cristobal Cotelawala Larisange Lecture Fund. It, she is a lifelong advocate of cross-cultural dialogue, international understanding, and the advancement of women, all characteristics, characteristics I'm sorry, that are embodied by Abiola. You can read more about the legacy of Cristobal Cotelawala Verisange, including her work in the UN and UNESCO on page 12 of today's program as well. During Abiola's presentation, please use the note cards that are on your table to jot down any questions, and when you're ready, you can raise them. Jessica will be around to collect them and um, so that we will have them for the question and answer afterward. Banaka and her husband, Essel, are both with us tonight. And let's give them a round of applause for making today's lecture possible while also welcoming Aviola to our stage. come from as an activist when we come to the stage like this I would say no women and you say no nation that means without women there can be a country so no women no nation you say no nation no women no nation no women thank you very much because without women there can ever be no nation um, it's really a big pleasure uh, to stand up here to give this lecture today. And um, I want to also uh, join uh, the moderator in eulogizing the, uh, the um, Christabel that this award is being, this lecture is being done in our memory. Um, I've read uh, CV and um, I'm very well uh, impressed. Um, you know, 
when we come around this world, we must leave our legacy behind. I think from my own point of view, this is a great legacy. And I want to congratulate her uh, for uh, doing this uh, while she was here and letting us remember her. I, I want to thank my sister that I've met this afternoon. Uh, it's a pleasure to meet you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much uh, at CEW Plus for inviting me uh, to make th this for this lecture. And um, I also want to thank Abby. Uh, we have been in touch for a very long time, speaking and writing. And so today I am meeting her. Thank you so much for this invitation and all the colleagues that I have met at the CEW Plus since I have been around. Uh, I want to recognize my uh, husband's best friend, the Vin childhood friend who works here in Michigan, who also in solidarity had come here to listen to me. Thank you so much. <laughs> now. So for coming all the way from the university. Um, my conversation here is to speak about my work in Nigeria and also to speak about the women's movement. Uh, one of the things that we believe is important is to build alliances. And I believe that this conversation today is also in that part to uh, increase our network, build alliances, learn from one another. Moving from post protest to policy has been a, a, a giant stride coming from a place like um, Africa. And I want to start with this slide to show that women have been organizing for quite a long time. And uh, from, the, uh, is, from the historical point of view, uh, we have record of women organizing as at 1861 uh, in, in Nigeria, pre-colonial, post-colonial, and of course, up to now. As of 1953, the Federation of Women Society, also a Nigerian Women Union in Abeokuta met. And what they had at that time was what they call shadow parliament, which they created you know, by themselves because they needed their voices to be heard. And they said, gathering together, that the assembly shall be known as the Federation of Nigerian Women Society, we are the voice of all Nigerian women will be heard and known. I'm starting from here to say that women have been contributing to development all over the world, and that in Nigeria, women have been organizing even uh, pre-independence. This is one of the... Um, photograph of one of the organizers. I think this was done about like um, maybe 15 years ago. And you can see from the inscription on the t-shirt, it's saying, women move now. And that was when we realized that we had to mobilize ourselves to resist patriarchy, to resist uh, discrimination and oppression that women continue to suffer. And I'm going to be speaking you know, about some of that uh, um, very soon. So the outline for this conversation is one to give a background, to trace some uh, historical perspective on women organizing from pre-colonial Nigeria to present day, and also to see the policy engagement and how far we have been able to go. Um, at the point in time, we came up under a group called Feminist Who Manifesto, uh, which is the biggest and the largest grouping in Nigeria today. And um, so I'm going to speak about the formation of Wu Manifesto. So moving from manifesto to Wu Manifesto. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that grouping. Uh, also, the future of women in Nigeria today, what, are, what has been our gains, what has been our challenges, and how are we planning uh, to see uh, the future? Nigeria... It's located in West Africa, and is a well, highly populated country with over 200 million people. Uh, the official language in Nigeria is English. Uh, Nigeria has the largest population of any African country. Um, it's also the most linguist linguistically diverse. So we have about um, 500 different languages, so meaning that 
the community next to you might be speaking another language that you don't understand. Uh, we also have over 250 ethnic groups, you know, in country. Uh, we have um, about 50% Muslim, and they are predominantly in the northern part of Nigeria, and f about 48% uh, Christian, and the rest of the 2% are idol worshippers, traditional worshippers, uh, and other religion. I will start uh, quickly with my sojourn and the imperative for establishing a women's center uh, in Nigeria. Um, growing up at the age of 13, I was in a secondary school uh, and um, was very active. You know, I was that kind of a child that you see doing everything, you know. So uh, there were some lecture teachers in school who came into school and were not uh, very forthright. So they ask you to go on the field. We normally use our hands to cut grasses, stay there, cut grass for like two hours. Then they just don't go for lectures. They would just disappear from the class. So we realized that there were some older students in class who were women. And when they disappeared, they disappeared with these women. And they come back in another like two hours, then ask us to go back to class. So this day, I just felt this was not right. Then I decided to call my classmates together. Then I climbed the table, trying to behave like Malcolm X, talking to them. You know, we cannot continue. This is not right. And you know, the class became very heated and everybody was banging the table saying, yes, yes. And that was going on. Then the principal wondered what was going on. So came into the class and found me on the table and asked me to come down and follow him right to his office. And I was suspended on that day from school. So I went back home and I told my dad this was what happened. And he said, well, you shouldn't have done that. Climbing the table was not the right thing to do. You should have gone to talk to the principal about what happened. Now let's go back to the principal. You would apologize for what you did, but you will explain to the principal what happened. So we went back and the principal started an investigation and realized that the lecturers were actually abusing uh, those students, you know, and the, lect the lecturers were punished. Now, in a way, that gave me a voice and also taught me about the right way to direct my protest. So um, I started, within the school, I was um, leading the Literary and Debating Society. It was a time of apartheid in South Africa. So I was leading discussions on that. I was reading a lot about Africa, about uh, um, colonialism and a whole lot of things. So I became the debater. I was winning award for speaking in public. And, and I think from there, from reading, from learning, I became uh, interested in participating in changing and transforming Nigeria. So by the time I got to the university, I became a student's union leader. And I won uh, one of the very historic elections on campus for the leadership of the students' union that no woman has ever won. So, and I remember that my uh, slogan then was that we are a tradition was lacking. A striking example becomes necessary. And I got a huge support from the students and I won that election. And that brought me you know, to uh, the uh, societal space, where as a student union leader during military regime, you are expected to lead struggles, lead protests, which were dangerous because it was military time. And um, so I ran into a lot of trouble with the state then because Nigeria was being run by decree. So there were times when we were arrested, when we were detained, and when, uh, well, but we managed to, to finish school and we managed to send out the military as a student body. So that was my sojourn. So I, I had a dream for, for the country. I had a purpose. I wanted to be part of the transformative process, to be part of making Nigeria better. And that's why I'm still uh, 
in the country up to today and still doing what I believe that we need to do to make Nigeria better. So that was the background to uh, my work. So while I was here, I was at Notre Dame University, uh, a student of, um, I was doing master's in law. I got a scholarship to look at, in, to, to study international human rights law. So I finished, I was at the International League for Human Rights in New York. Then Nigeria changed from military to civilian rule. And there was a problem. A woman in, a, in the northern part of the country was going to be stoned to death for uh, uh, being accused of committing adultery because Nigeria has um, made Sharia a state religion. It was supposed to be a personal religion. So, and I was here and I felt, no, we had to do something. So I had to leave New York and went back to Nigeria to join other women to lead the campaign on Safiya must not die. You know, because it was going to be a precedent. So meaning that any pregnant woman, a woman will become another vulnerable person. So we, we were able to lead that campaign. We engaged the ulamas, the Muslim clerics, and were able to ensure that Safiya was not killed. And after that, we started engaging the religious space in Nigeria to ensure that the law that allows for stoning people to death, you know, would not uh, remain. So, and it was at that point that the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center was formed. And of course, this was also an issue for constitution. So one of the things we started working on was to build work around changing the laws, changing constitution. So as we speak, we take over 1,000 cases on a yearly basis. Uh, we go to court, we uh, support uh, women and also do uh, a lot of other things. Now, in saying this, it's also important to put this in context, that women have been uh, involved in canvas for protection of human rights generally, from the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights you know, to the passage of the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women in 1979 and other laws that. And um, we have moved from uh, when they had the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and were asking the question, uh, the Universal Declaration, the, law, the, the rights there, did they really cover women? to having the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination. And in Africa, we got to a level where we felt that uh, those laws at the UN were not speaking to us because of the economic crisis and the problem of tradition and religion that we face on a daily basis. And because the laws were not addressing those issues. So we worked with the women to come up with the uh, African Protocol on the Rights of Women and also the ECOWAS Protocol on the rights of women. So in linking that to the struggle that we see uh, in Nigeria, so we have uh, alliance across Africa where um, women meet either on the African Feminist Forum or other uh, forum where we agree on what we need to see as the change that we will see in Africa. And that has led to uh, a lot of uh, changes that we have seen in Africa today. Uh, so we've been using mass protest, and that's why we are moving from the discussion of protest to policy. So we are using mass protest uh, to raise the issue. Uh, you can see one of the pictures there is Nigerian women occupied the National Assembly. Uh, and that occupation was done for one month, uh, insisting that the government must recognize the constitution that must be inclusive as we speak today, the constitution is supposed to be the basic law that should uh, be respected by everyone. But the constitution we have in Nigeria allows for child marriage, meaning that it says that any child, anyone that is married is deemed to be an adult. So meaning that even if you are nine years old and you have been married off, you are deemed to be an adult. I will ask uh, in my class, I will say good law or bad law, <laughs> you know. So it's, so it's um, that kind of constitution that we have currently. So, and we also have a constitution that does not allow equal citizenship for men and women. 
uh, if I am married to someone from America, my husband can never be a citizen of Nigeria. But if the man is married to someone from America, the husband, the wife, can become a citizen of Nigeria. So within the constitution, so there is also that uh, discrimination you know, against women. And of course, the clause which deals with discrimination also gives in one hand and take away you know, from the other and says you can be discriminated against in work in private places, you know, as long as it's not uh, in public spaces. So there are a lot of issues that we are still dealing with uh, within the constitutional framework. So the women's movement in Nigeria started from pre-colonial area where women were holding traditional positions uh, and they were very strong in, in doing that. And um, the colonial master felt intimidated by the women and decided to uh, conspire with the, uh, uh, with the patriarchal system uh, at that time. And of course, the whole thing turned around. So women became much more vulnerable uh, in the society. And we can see that ran through pre-colonial, post-colonial. So they took the power from the women and uh, make them to be much more vulnerable. Uh, if we trace all the history, you will see in the 50s, women had organized uh, in 5,000, 10,000 women, you know, to fight against taxation, to fight against uh, other things that are critical and important, including violence against women. There, are, there were also other forms of organizing uh, after that during military regime, there were different ways that Nigerian women had engaged. Uh, there's been marches, there's been picketing, strike, and a whole lot of other ways, vigil, uh, petition, and uh, other ways that. So we have had a lot of uh, selected uh, success story when those uh, marches actually turned around, you know, to become uh, gains for policies or for any other thing for women. The 1929 about women riots, the uh, NSAS, which was one of the biggest uh, movements in Nigeria, which took place around 2019, was actually uh, coordinated by Feminist Coalition, which is a group of young women who had come together to say it's enough. You know, we can't continue to live in a country where our rights are not respected. They bring back our girls movements. If you recall, some young girls were uh, taken by uh, the uh, uh, Islamic terrorists uh, insurgents, the Boko Haram in uh, Nigeria, about 265 girls were taken away. Uh, we have been able to uh, get back about um, 118. So there were still quite a number of them. that are. So we started a movement called the Bring Back Our Girls Movement. And that movement has been sustainable up till now. There has been also several other movements uh, which had led to policies. Currently, Nigeria has uh, the Violence Against Persons Prohibition Law in the entire 36 state, which deals with addressing issues of domestic violence, uh, which deals with addressing uh, issues of female gender mutilation, uh, of early child marriage. Uh, before then, we have a section 55 of the Pena Code, which says you can beat your wife in as much as it does not cause grievous harm. So we have that in the law at that point before the advocacy for us to change the law and we're able to strike out some part of that uh, law. So patriarchy and religion has manifested in different ways, with the Sharia law being passed by over uh, uh, 18 states across Nigeria, uh, with the early marriage that is still there, but there are laws now that are outlawing it, but we still need to do a lot to ensure that. There are also issues about land ownership in inheritance, if you are, which is oftentimes based on the fact that if you are a woman, you cannot inherit. If you are a man, you can inherit in some part of the country. Uh, violence against women uh, during COVID-19, it was terrible. So the, the case was uh, as bad as uh, anyone can imagine. Uh, so women gathered together and we insisted that the state must declare a state of emergency on violence against women. And um, we went, despite the COVID, we went on protest and the state had no option than to declare a state of emergency. And today about 36 states across Nigeria have been able to uh, pass law prohibiting violence against women and girls. The issue of child preference, when you have a girl child and you have a boy child, you want to invest more in the, girl, in the boy child, you know, as opposed to girl child. In the genship, when a woman is married and you are from a particular uh, state, you cannot contest election in the other states because you are a woman. They will tell you you have been married off. So 
You can only go back to your father's house. And when you go back, they say, oh, but you have left. So it makes women also to be uh, stateless. Um, there are also inst institutional discrimination, uh, which you find in laws, uh, particularly the, the question about um, age of majority. Uh, so is he 18 or lesser? So there are issues like that. Um, there are also a lot of uh, political system not, not favorable to uh, women uh, on issues of gender equality. If you go to the police and you want to take the bail of your child because you are a woman, you are not allowed to, to bail, to take the bail to release your child on your re personal recognition. But you're, you're, if you are a man, you are allowed to do that. So there are a lot of um, areas that is uh, not... So as we speak, Nigeria has 20% of the global maternal deaths uh, happens in Nigeria. So the situation is very bad for, for women. Their right to reproductive health, it's they are seriously threatened. Uh, there are disparities also in access to education. 48.1% of girls enrolled in school compared to 59.9% of boys. And in some part of the country, particularly in the Northeast part, we still have about 70% of women that cannot read and write. And what's the implication of that for economy, for growth? Um, so, the, so there are also issues about land ownership. And data has shown that 70% of those who till the land and who are smallholder farmers are women, yet they cannot own the land. So, they, they, so in, in terms of land ownership, there are less than 10% women who uh, can own the land in the country. Um, so because of all this, we, cannot, we, we, we refuse to sit down and allow things to continue going. So we decided to build a strong movement you know, to respond to some of these issues so that we can change the lives of, uh, of women and girls uh, in the country. Uh, so we have had several different um, interventions and several uh, movements to address some of these issues. And I'm going to speak particularly about one or two of them. One of them was um, 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 where we had to come up with charter of demands uh, for uh, political parties who are coming into election and they had to sign uh, with the uh, women. I was sharing that this morning with the Ford School uh, about how we had uh, called those who are running for election to sign. And so one of them became the governor of the state and decided to violate all the things that he signed in public in front of about 5,000 women. And we wrote to him and say, but you didn't, you have started violating what you agreed with us because you wanted women to vote for you. And he said, but it was just, it was just um, an agreement. It didn't really mean anything. Oh, and we said, okay. So in the evening we sat together and said, what do we do? So we agreed one to get a poster, to get like 500 posters with his picture you know, when it's signed, we make them to pick whatever they sign, they put it up like this. So we put it up like that when it's signed. So we got the picture where it showed what is signed, that you can read everything that is signed with his signature. So we got that. Then we agreed that nine o'clock in the morning, exactly 9.05, everyone. So we had a text message to send text messages to you. So he had about 2,000 people sending him text messages at the same time. Then he woke up in the morning, then saw his pictures everywhere with what he signed. Then he invited the women to come back and negotiate with him. And uh, in that place, in that state, we got 45% women in, as members of the uh, cabinet during the eight years of his regime. He, he comes back and say, I better do it because if I don't do it, these women are going to come after me. <laughs> So one of the things we also do is also to engage with the uh, rural communities. So uh, we set up uh, what we call the paralegal community, which were people in communities who are working to respond to issues of violence, issues of uh, political participation. So they participate in civic uh, duties you know, in their communities. So we also work with women traditional leaders who uh, uh, head of the chiefs who are also head of market women and also religious uh, organization. Um, through this intervention, there has been a lot of strategic litigation that has been done. Some of the cases have been won and some 
several of the cases are yet to be won. Also because uh, some of the courts are not very sensitive to gender and they rather want to uh, uh, kill the uh, spirit. Uh, so we have won some at the ECOWAS court. So if we can't get it won in Nigeria, then we'll run to the regional courts, you know, to be able to uh, get a precedent in that regard. Recently, uh, the Nigerian women won a very landmark one, uh, um, where I was also part of the uh, plaintiffs. When we took the government to court on the fact that the national gender policy allows for gender equality. And we realized that in the president's appointment, he has never gone beyond 5% women in his appointment. And we took him to court. And the court, interestingly, gave the judgment in our favor. Now, having done that, the government was supposed to do another appointment. So we then wrote to the government to say, you know, we have a judgment against you. So please make sure that you respond to gender equality on this level. Then it quickly went to court, to the court of appeal, to appeal against the judgment. So we are in the court of appeal uh, currently. So we've also used, used court strategic litigation to do that. Now we realized in 2017 that we were all working at different spaces and it was like we we're working in silos and that there was a need for us to come together and strengthen our work. And that was how we started the feminist uh, woman manifesto. Uh, in 2017. Uh, the Feminist Woman Festo has supported us a lot in networking. Uh, we have quite a huge number of women together. We have a platform which has taken over a thousand women uh, uh, organizations who are leaders of women organizations who are feminists who come together in different states to make sure that they respond to uh, some of the issues. Um, we also have what we call what Nigerian women want. So we had come together to come up with a charter of demand where we identify six critical issues that the government must respond to within a period of time. And it's called what the Nigerian women want. Um, so we work also with um, women. The first ladies in Nigeria have also joined that movement. Uh, so they have helped in terms of facilitating, uh, as an agency, facilitating passage of laws and also being part of the issues because some of them have also suffered uh, the violence that we are talking about. So we have worked also with rural women. Uh, so we have structures at that level. So we have structures in communities. Um, as an organization, we work with over 120 communities across Nigeria, uh, from the north to the south. In the place where the Boko Haram insurgency was, we have been able to pass violence against persons prohibition law. And um, I personally have traveled there not less than 20 times. And people say, oh, you are taking a risk. But the risk has paid us off because we have been able to translate some of the issues that we're talking about to laws in those places. So there were about six issues that we presented. The, issues of, the issue of uh, addressing violence against women, addressing issues of women political participation, addressing the issue of women's economy, and that's very important. And we had put forward the feminist alternative uh, to uh, the way the system of economy is being you know, responded to in Nigeria. That is people-centered, that is women-centered. Uh, there are issues of sexual and reproductive health, from what I had said with the uh, global maternal death that women have to face on a daily basis. So it's a priority issue for us. Uh, the issue of women, peace, and security, uh, we had pushed for more uh, indigenous knowledge of women who know their community. The government has been so formal about responding to peace and security, but we're saying that there are several uh, uh, women who can also uh, participate in that. So the issue of human capital development and the issue of constitutional reforms have been some of the issues that we have put forward before the government. Uh, we are also insisting that there's no way we can move forward in the implementation of laws without resources, you know, that the budget must also be sensitive you know, to the need of women to be able to ensure that we have uh, more women educated. We also need political will in that regard. Um, so our gains have been from the protest ground, we have been able to achieve a lot of laws. Uh, a lot of changes have happened. Uh, we have more institutions established. About um, five years ago, I think it was only Lagos that has a shelter but now we have almost like seven states with shelters, 
where you know they can respond to women. They also have sexual assault referral center. Uh, they have the which we have now in about thirty six in about twenty six states out of the thirty six states. Uh, so we we are in, we are we are pushing for more institutions to be built to respond to uh, women issues. Uh, we have had more coordinated platform. Uh, with ability to quickly respond to issues affecting people, uh, whether it's from the south or from the north, women have been able to stand together, you know, to push for their issues. Uh, in constitutional amendments, uh, with that picture that I showed earlier, we put together five gender bills, to which deals with citizenship, indigenship, affirmative action, and two other issues that has to do with appointment and political parties. And we pushed that forward, and we were able to negotiate that to the last stage. So they got to the National Assembly, and they shut down the five gender bills, which was why we went to the National Assembly. After staying in the National Assembly for one month, they, decided, they, they went back to vote, because they realized that we were not going to leave. So we were waking up there every morning. So I became the general of the women's movement. So we get there very early in the morning and uh, stay there and um, leave at seven, then resume again at seven. And this were women in politics, women in private sector, rural women, women in academia, you know. So we had quite a number. We had about, on daily basis, like between 2,000 and 3,000 women, you know, staying in front of the National Assembly. So they had no option then to come and negotiate uh, with the women. So they came back and... Uh, did the vote again and add three of the votes. Um, uh, they, they voted for three of the bills. So now we're waiting for concurrence with the uh, Senate on the issue. So meaning that staying there was not uh, in vain because it was when they agreed to step down on three that we decided to leave the National Assembly because they were actually not holding any meeting. They were not doing, uh, passing the laws or doing anything during that period. So we have also been able to engage the traditional and religious spaces because that's where patriarchy is uh, very, very uh, dominated. So we have been able to uh, re uh, respond to those spaces too and get a lot of allies in that. In uh, a particular place where they say, uh, they, they call it um, wife slave, where when a, they, when a man is owing, gets a loan, so he, he uses his daughter to uh, secure the loan. So if he can't pay back, the person takes the daughter. And that's in Cross River State, and that was still happening as of last year, you know, until uh, we were able to uh, uh, resist that and the community came out to uh, outlaw uh, that practice. So there are a whole lot like that. So there have been challenges uh, in our work, um, lack of political will. Uh, and a whole lot of other things, uh, issues re re relating to bodily integrity. What happened here with Roe against Wade also affected us a little bit. Uh, in Lagos State, uh, we had passed a law on safe termination of pregnancy uh, in Lagos State. And when this happened in the, in the US, so they came back. Uh, so we had, we just woke up in the morning and we saw the Catholic, you know, came up to say that Lagos had passed a law that is not acceptable that runs against the, uh, so it became a religious thing and legal state had no option than to step down, you know, the law. So the, the what happened here affected, you know, what happened in Nigeria. So there are weak institutions, culture and socialization impunity is still there. We are still dealing with that. So this is my last slide. So what are we doing? We, we are building a strong variety movement that can hold the government accountable because we believe that we need that solidarity. We need strong women organizing, you know, to be able to uh, push back against patriarchy. We need to uh, organize and strengthen our force to be able to address the problem that has continued to uh, uh, reduce our strength as women. We also need to ensure that our voices are heard, so meaning that we have to be in the decision table, you know, to be able to make decisions for the country. Women in Nigeria are ready to lead transformative change for so long, since 1960. Nigeria is about um, 60 years now. The men have been leading the country, and we have not really seen any benefit for 
the nation. It is now time for women to lead. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you so much. You've spoken so eloquently about all the complexity of the forces that come together, religion, government, that all contribute to uh, a system that really wim uh, limits women's rights. On the other hand, you've given us hope about what happens when you, re what do you what's your phrase, refuse to sit down. So we should all refuse to sit down. We're all sitting now, but we should all refuse to sit down. <laughs> Uh, at this time, I'm going to invite uh, Dr. Abigail Stewart, Joy Naviola, on the stage. Dr. Stewart is a Sandra Schwartz Tangri Distinguished University Professor of Psychology and Women and Gender Studies. Dr. Stewart will engage in dialogue with Aviola and incorporate your questions as possible into the conversation. And if um, folks have written down questions, hold them up and we will pass them on to. Uh, Dr. Stewart, so that she can ask them of Aviola. So, here we go. Thank you. Uh, how's that? You can hear? Okay, great. Thank you. Um, I just have to take a moment to say this is a very personal connection today. Um, Abiola is one of the interviewees in the Global Feminisms Project archive that is at the University of Michigan on our website. Um, I want to encourage anyone who hasn't visited it to do that, if for no other reason than to hear another opportunity to hear Abiola, but also other women activists in Nigeria and around the world. Um, as Abiola said, we've had a chance to communicate over email <laughs> for a very long time, it seems. And um, it just, I'd never quite imagined that I would have an opportunity to meet in person, uh, especially once the pandemic happened. Um, and when Tiffany told me that CEW Plus was thinking about inviting you, I, it was just such an exciting moment. So four of my colleagues, from the team are here. Uh, we have a large kind of interdisciplinary, intergenerational team of people on the Global Feminisms Project, and I know they're all as excited as I am to have a chance to hear you in person and to meet you uh, once we're finished. I'm somewhat deliberately giving you all time to think about your questions because uh, you've been patiently listening a lot, and I wanna give you a chance to ask your questions. But now I'd like to also um, speak directly to you. A few things in your, many things in your talk um, were incredibly potent and impressive, but three things I want to mention. Um, one is, you know, you spoke about Nigeria as this um, divided country, divided at least in terms of religion, excuse me, religion and geography. It's also a large, diverse country with many, it's pluralistic, lots of different kinds of people and languages. And uh, it reminds me of another country, <laughs> uh, one that we're sitting in. <laughs> and it seems to me that um, we just have an awful lot to learn from the strategies I heard you talk about. Um, we've been doing things, trying things, and yet it feels like we have a lot to learn from you. I hope there's ways we can have something to offer you too, and, uh, and, and to Nigeria, but um, it feels like this is a conversation that should continue between these two countries. Um, I'll give you a chance to comment on these comments in a second. But two more things really struck me. One is over and over, Abiola told us about events that didn't work, <laughs> protests that didn't work, and they refused to sit down is right, but not only that, each time not only did they persist, they raised the stakes. <laughs> so you don't like that? We'll make it a little worse for you. <laughs> 
I think that's a strategy, the raising of stakes, that I'm not sure we've got going in the women's movement as successfully as what you outlined in the US. So um, I think there's a lot for us to learn. Persistence is a, yeah, the long game is the game we all have to be playing because to create, I loved a feminist Nigeria. I've never heard anyone say we need a feminist United States, and yet we do. So um, thank you for the vision and for all the stories and now let me give you a moment to kind of respond to what I've had to say. <laughs> well, um, so wh why are we raising the stakes? Mm -hmm. Can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Is it on? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, just maybe close. All right, thank you. All right, um, well, Nigeria is quite divided. And um, whether with geography or with religion. But for women, our issues are the same. Yeah. Whether from the north, whether from the south. Women in the north suffer violence. Women in the south do the same. So we have a commonality that helps in terms of coming up with shared vision. So it's, um, it's not very difficult to relate with one another. So that has helped. Uh, because uh, in Nigeria, the fact that um, you are rich or you are a professor also does not, you know, make you not to be vulnerable. The vice chancellor of a university uh, was at a meeting and she was not allowed to break the cola. So they had to call someone because she's a woman. So it doesn't really matter whether, you know, uh, you hold a position or not, you know. So the vulnerability seems to be um, uh, a leveler. Mm -hmm. So it helps in terms of mobilizing. It helps in terms of, you know, getting people to agree, you know, to uh, work together. So I, I think that helped in terms of our mobilization. And I think the solidarity is also there, mm -hmm. uh, which can move from south to the north. Uh, when the, the issue of Safia, was happening in the northern part of Nigeria, but everybody from Lagos, from Abuja, from Southeast, were part of the movement saying that Safia, you know, must not die. So there's that solidarity. And I think we can trace it back to uh, colonial, pre-colonial period that women have been organizing. So they have passed that solidarity down, you know, to generations to come. So, and that has helped in strengthening uh, solidarity. Now, the issue of raising the stakes, is also because our reality in the real sense it's very porous, it's very bad. Um, women would stay in front of National Assembly because the truth of the matter is that if you have to live on um, one dollar, less than a dollar in a day, the reality is that the government is not responsive enough. It's not doing enough to be able to address your need. So there's an agreement that something is wrong. So mobilizing people around issues then becomes uh, uh, something that is easy uh, because people also, they can feel it so they know what it is, you know, so, so that might be the reason. So that's why when we move to, we want to move to the next level yeah, because we know that um, uh, we need to be constant, we need to remain consistent in what we are doing. The kind of system that we are dealing with, the kind of patriarchy that we are dealing with, I know there is patriarchy everywhere but I think our own patriarchy is different. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's important for us to understand and um, know about. You know much more about us than many of us know about Nigeria, so, um, which, is, which is a very sad thing. So let me ask one more question and then I'll go to questions you've asked um, from the audience. Um, if you had to name, I don't know, two or three things that you wish Americans knew about Nigeria, so that they could understand the things, what would those be? There are several things that <laughs> Americans should know about Nigeria. We have a very rich culture, very rich culture. Nigeria is very accommodating, um, and um, there's a lot of solidarity across the country. So there's a lot of, uh, and you know, there was a report that said Nigeria is the happiest country in the world, you know, because uh, despite the situation, uh, people still 
feel smile. It's still smile. So you meet, you know, so it's people, uh, I don't know whether you know about a fella Nicola Koputi who says suffering and smiling, you know. <laughs> so it's, so it's, it's a very unique disposition. And, um, and I don't know whether you know a lot about Nigerians who are here. They still want to come back home. So there's that bond uh, of where, you know, you are, you are from and you, you have that, you know, heritage. So I, I think those are very, you probably don't find that in a, a whole lot of places. Right. So it's, um, so I can say that we're very accommodating, very friendly. Uh, and it's also a very, it's a good community and we have very good jollof rice too. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. They're very good, rich food, rich culture. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, one of your questions from the audience is how do you define feminism? Does it include more than just women? I I'm maybe going to take just out of that, but more than women. <laughs> and how do you account for connections across other identities? Okay, um, feminism includes more than women. Uh, it's an ideology. It's a belief system that builds on ensuring that there's no discrimination whatsoever, you know, to, for women because of uh, our state, you know, or our situation as women. Also believe that uh, so that's why I said it's not it's not limited to women. So there are we have had we have women in Nigeria and we have men, and it's a feminist movement. So there are men. There are even some men who are more feminist than you know <laughs> some women who are part of the uh, 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 system that continues to oppress women. So uh, any man who believes that women uh, are not supposed to be discriminated against or marginalized who believe in the ideology of empowerment of women and emancipation of women, you know, it's a feminist and who acts in according to that, in accordance to that is a feminist, yeah. And what about other identities um, like class, you mentioned status yes. or um, ethnic differences within Nigeria? Well, uh, that's, that, that, that does not make you less uh, a feminist. I mean, the fact that you belong to uh, a particular class. And that's why I say it's, it's an ideology. It's an ideology that brings everyone together uh, to fight oppression. Uh, uh, that believes that social movement, social resolution is the only way, you know, to deal with oppressors and... Um, so it's so so it's not in Nigeria. I know that, um, and I and I'm trying to, I'm trying to preempt what you are trying to say. There are a lot of cultural issues that you know affect um, socialization and a, 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 and you know that provides for stereotypes and and all of that. But as a feminist, we are not feminist bot. You are a feminist bot if you say. Well, I'm a feminist, but there are things that I don't believe in, like, for example, issues of safe termination of pregnancy, women's right to their bodily integrity, or women's uh, right to be able to choose uh, whether uh, their sexual orientation, mm -hmm. then you are a feminist bot. So we are feminists and we are feminists. So on the platform, we have an agreement on issues like that. Issues of respecting people's dignity, respecting people's right to be who they want to be and supporting and promoting and ensuring that any form of discrimination that wants to come to such a person is resisted. Thank you. Yeah. Another question. Um, what have your experiences with transnational feminist collaborations um, brought movements you've been a part of? How has that worked? Uh, I was... Um, in the steering committee of the uh, uh, global feminist movement uh, that is being supported by the uh, school in New Jersey, Radhika Kumswe, uh, um, Feminist Alliance for Rights. So it's called FAR. You can look at them on the, and which is also trying to ensure because of course there are issues about the global south and the, uh, you know, and the north. 
and the extent to which uh, feminism manifests between the two blocks. Uh, there, there, there is a need to, because there are a lot of issues from the global south, you know, yeah. that's, you know, yeah. yes, that are unique and um, which has been part of the conversation of uh, feminism uh, right from the onset that there's a need to expand more, you know, on our context and our, our understanding, you know, of issues to be able to take into consideration those other issues that affect people, particularly from the global north. So we have been engaging at the level of the African Feminist Forum. Uh, we also have the Nigerian Feminist Forum. We have the Feminist Women Manifesto. We have the Feminist Alliance, you know. Art. <laughs> So we have been building alliance because we also believe that alliance is important, you know, to strengthen uh, the feminist movement generally. So has one of these collaborations been seemed to you to be particularly effective? I believe on issues of sexual and reproductive rights. Uh -huh. uh, there's been a lot of um, um, success uh, story in that regard. There's been a lot of solidarity mm -hmm. uh, um, in that regard. Uh, we have. Uh, collaborated with the Center for Reproductive Rights uh, for for years, uh, and they've done quite a lot of work in in Nigeria. So we have been able to build alliances in that regard. Um, I have this question in the broader frame, but the way it's framed here is: What have you found most effective when engaging with conservative religious groups about? advocating for women's rights, especially ones that are not part of their worldview. And more generally, I'm curious about what you, how you manage to build consensus across these very strongly held beliefs. It's, 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 it's a long journey. It's not, it's not, uh, it just didn't happen, you know. Um, I know that for a very long time, we were looking at the uh, religious text uh, you know, oftentimes when you want to uh, make the other person vulnerable, you can quote a particular part of the Bible and say that uh, what you are doing is against Bible in John 3, so, 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 you know. And so that's the same thing with the Quran. So people use the text to justify and legitimize, you know, patriarchy. So what we do is to first uh, uh, look, uh, deconstruct, those issues within the text. You know, so we engage a lot of people to uh, read the text, for example, the Sharia crisis in Nigeria. So we engage a lot of people to use the, the text, and then so we do a positive reading of the text as opposed to the negative reading, you know, uh, yes, of the text. So we reinterpret it and, you know, uh, get more people to open up conversation on uh, what the religious text is saying rather than... Uh, that has been, yes. Like the issue of the safe termination of, uh, of pregnancy, um, we were able to get women who were leading Catholic groups to understand that if we look at the data in Nigeria, a lot of people are dying from unsafe abortion. So why should there be no guidelines you know, responding to this? And people were shocked that um, uh, women who were leading Catholic, Catholic group uh, church group came up speaking, you know, for it, but it took a process. Yeah. So we break it down, explain, and let people understand how they are connected to the issue. Yeah. So it's not something that just happened like that. So it takes a process. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to think that women have to be dying mm -hmm. for this, this argument to work, but, uh, yeah. So, uh, one more question about your movements, the, the different ones, how, how do they get funded? And how can we here support what's going on in Nigeria? Um, we need, we need um, the support of everyone, uh, you know, to further strengthen the movement. So it could be in terms of um, academic discussion, you know, because there are feminists uh, within the academia who can contribute, who can, who have enough um, data, who have enough research that they've done that we can compare to see how we can build the uh, global uh, feminism. Now I'm coming back to, you know, to build global feminism because I think we have to depend, you know, on, on one another to be able to have uh, a feminist world, 
you know, Beyond Feminist Nigeria, we must be looking forward to uh, a feminist award, which is a award that is just, that is equitable, you know, that takes into consideration everyone, that is sent, people centered. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, we, the feminist will manifesto in particular. We took uh, a decision not to open it up to uh, donor funding or external funding. So we ensure that we uh, engage in self-funding uh, within ourselves. Like we were in front of the National Assembly for 30 days, but women in Nigeria were bringing down, they were paying for it. You know, they bring water, some bring food, you know, some bring um, whatever we need, whether it's money to buy the food and all of that. So we, we, we believe that within us, we should be able, you know, to strengthen the movement that can work for all of us. So Out, outside funding. But uh, in other feminist work uh, that has been done by center, by schools, uh, we will, we are open to collaboration with uh, other schools, yeah. Yeah, it's important, yeah. Uh, as well as with um, knowing when it's wanted and not when it's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'd like to invite anyone who didn't get the, a question asked um, by me for you <laughs> to ask if you'd like to anything right now. Um, you've been a wonderful, patient audience, but um, you could ask a question the usual old-fashioned way. Just let me know you want to. Yeah. Hmm. Could people hear the question? Yeah, the use of text and specifically social media in the movement. Yeah, the, so social media has become a very a very terrible tool, particularly from the uh, younger generation. Uh, if you look at the data, Nigeria has one of the uh, biggest uh, social media <laughs> uh, people who use the social media, and they are majorly young people. Um, the there was uh, a movement called End SARS, which was ending police brutality in the country. It was supported by young people and it was a social media thing. And the movement was one of the largest in the last few years. Over like 150,000 people were uh, mobilized across the country. Uh, and the movement were basically young people and they held the country bound for like about, like about a month or two, like about three weeks, you know. Uh, and it was a mobilization that was done on the social media and it was led by the feminist coalition. So it's called Feminist Co. And through that coalition online, they were able to raise uh, millions, you know, to support the uh, movement. So the social media, it's a very veritable tool that has been used by the movement. Is there a particular field in which women are very underrepresented that Nigeria has a need for more women? Is that the question? Yeah. <laughs> I think it almost in all the, the sectors. Almost all. Yes. <laughs> in all the sectors, yeah. Um, you know, there's a whole lot of talk around STEM, uh, which is about um, um, science, mathematics, you know, and all that, because uh, we have less uh, women, you know, uh, doing sciences. So because of the patriarchy, so you don't find women in, so the data that is coming out, I think it's only, even the, the teaching job or the, 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 the teaching job and maybe being a nursing job, yeah, you have quite a number of women, but I think for the rest, it's not, we she haven't, yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, so teaching and nonsense, I think that's where we have quite a number of women, but I think the rest, whether it's law, 
whether it's engineering, uh, whether it's um, any other um, field, it's been very lopsided. Well, I would like to thank you all, but I most of all would like to thank Abiola for coming here, for making a commitment to the University of Michigan by spending a month here, or about a month. And um, I'd like to also invite um, you all to have more informal interaction with Abiola, at least for a few minutes once we stop, and perhaps you have things you need to say. I have, I have one more request I just remember, okay. <laughs> uh, the request I want to make, make is that I think that um, there's a need for us to have some collaborative research mm -hmm. uh, between Nigeria feminism and what is happening here. Yeah. So maybe that's one collaboration that can be done uh, with the Feminist uh, Women Manifesto, yeah. Uh, so that's a, a request to all of us. So thank you for that. So let's thank Abiola for a wonderful... <laughs> Can I do? Oh. No, <laughs> Thank you. Okay, as we close the day, I hope that all of you have found today to reflect our theme of creating change through introspection, dialogue, and action. Uh, also, I'd like to thank our presenters, TIAA, Manaka, and Essel, and Twink Fry for their contribution and generosity. I'd also like to thank the CW Plus staff and the staff here at the League for all your help uh, and support today. I think that we can take away from today, or at least I can take away from today, the idea and notion that being an advocate and an activist is not a cape that we just put on. We can all do our part even in small ways to advance social justice and improve the lives of those whose voices and needs are not represented or seen. Our speakers today have demonstrated the power of tenacity and passion to move the needle. We are inspired by their work. May we all take the lessons to heart to help make positive differences in our own communities and our own sphere of influence. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.